given to me by Woody Shaw, Sonship, Dizzy, and John Kahn, dedicated to pursuing a piece of our cultural heritage through interviews with my music heroes. This is the Jake Feinberg Show. Welcome, everybody, inside the Brady Broadcasting Studios at 25 East Glen. This is the Jake Feinberg Show. So happy you could be part of the program today. My guest today is one of the most highly decorated musicians in our country's history. To him, music has no idiomatic labeling. It's just music. This is evidenced by the list of musicians he has collaborated with over the years. Greg Ullman, Herbie Mann, The Stable Singers, Lulu, Levon Helm, Bobby Womack, Lonnie Mack, Russell Smith, Willie Nelson, and Millie Jackson. I have covered studio cats who played Motown and the Wrecking Crew in Southern California. And today I have an opportunity to continue my regional exploration of music that existed in this country, that being Muscle Shoals. My guest was part of the rhythm section that locked the groove for curious artists looking for a Gulf Coast feel. Along with Roger Hawkins and Barry Beckett, my guest found his way in, out, up, and around the cosmic vortex of eccentric personalities, pentatonic scales, and passion that makes music feel good. One of the original Swampers, David Hood, welcome to the Jake Feinberg Show. Yeah, thank you very much. I'm happy to be part of it. You know, I wanted you, what we were just talking about before we went on air here, um, the uh, this PBS uh, uh, movie on Muscle Shoals uh, has been out for now over a year, and I was hoping you could talk about um, a little bit about the the film and and if you think it's portrayed correctly and and kind of the responses that that you've gotten because of it. I think it's uh, p- portrayed correctly. It's condensed, obviously. You can't put uh, forty years worth of music in a, a, in. A, I think it's a an hour and eleven minutes, something like that. Uh, it's so it's a uh, hard to get all the hit all the bases, but it it uh, it was pretty good. Did but you? The people who made the movie were big music fans, uh, and they just happened upon Muscle Shows by accident. They were taking a car from Virginia to uh, New Mexico, and just happened to see a, a, a road sign, and thought, well, we'll pull off here and see what's going on, and they discovered that. They were in in Muscle Shows, where all these hit records were recorded, and uh, uh, it just goes from there. And neither one of these guys had ever made a movie. Unbelievable. So these guys were just sort of, you know, look, they were thinking about doing documentaries, but they didn't have a topic, and they just waltz, they just happened to, you know, ramble into Muscle Shows. That's incredible. Yeah, I'm not even sure they were thinking about making documentaries. They were both music fans and movie fans. And uh, the director, uh, Freddie Camilleer, uh, I think always hoped one day to make a documentary, but I don't think that they were on that trip. I think they were just having a, a good time taking a car across the country. And uh, <laughs> right. it was an accidental discovery, I believe. You know, my, I, my first question for you, David, uh, is, you know, I, like I said in my opening, I, I have become obsessed with this period of time in music before labeling became huge and you had all these regional pockets of music, everything from Appalachia and the, and the Smoky Mountains up through, you know, the, the New York to Boston corridor, the Chicago shuffle. There was just every region of the country had a different sound. And like you said, uh, Muscle Shoals had its own sound. And I'm, I would love you to try to, to t- talk to the audience about the regional music of Muscle Shoals, Alabama. Well, we didn't really know that we had a sound. I know when I was I was a, a big record fan and music fan growing up, and I could tell records that were recorded in New Orleans, obviously Detroit, Memphis. We were big fans of uh, the Stax records and the Sun records before that. And uh, but we when we started recording, we didn't really. Play
plan on having a sound of our own. We were just trying to to make records that fit each artist that we were working with. Uh, we didn't didn't weren't really looking to make a uh, an identifying sound. Uh, we weren't aware of that. But now, listening back after 50 years, I, I see that there is a, a common sound to a lot of the records. But uh, when you think about recording with a rock artist one week and the next week a soul artist and the next week a, a pop or country artist, we we didn't intend to have a sound of our own. How did you, I guess maybe more to the point though, like you 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 would uh, see records from from Motown or Stax, you'd know, how'd you know it was from there? Just because it was, it would say it or because there was a certain kind of feel or, or a sound to it? Like a... Well, it, there, there was a sound to it that was pretty identifiable. I think right from the start, if you're a big music fan, I think anyone could tell you that. I, I don't think that exists at this time today, but uh, at one time, uh, when I was starting out, we, we could hear music that was, recorded in New Orleans, and we knew it was recorded in New Orleans, and we didn't know who the musicians were, what the studios were, and that's true probably for the Motown records. There were never names on the early records that I listened to of the musicians or, or anything, but after a while, you could you could tell that it was the same people on a lot of the records just because of the sound, mm-hmm. and uh, that's true for Chicago and Memphis and everywhere else, I guess. It, it is, and so... It is true. How did you know, like, what was the New Orleans sound? Well, when I was learning, and when I started, we were we had a small band. We'd play fraternity parties and school dances and things like that. And there was a record album that we all were passing around to each other. Uh, it was called New Orleans, Home of the Blues. And it wasn't a blues record. It was a record that had Irma Thomas and Ernie Cato and Lee Dorsey. And a lot of the other New Orleans stars, I believe it was on Minute Records, I'm not sure, but it was a, a, a compilation of a lot of New Orleans music. And uh, I, we all loved that, and, and the, that music was the kind of music that was popular at fraternity parties. And uh, so we we would learn from those records. And it's true also for uh, Stax Records and, and, and Motown Records. When I started... Uh, working as a studio musician, I, my, the first session I did was a gold record. It was uh, Warm and Tender Love by Percy Sledge, and it was the follow-up to a, When a Man Loves a Woman. Mm-hmm. And when we recorded this and it came out and started selling a lot, all of a sudden I was getting calls for, from people wanting me to play on their recordings. And so I had to learn how to play really quickly, uh, more than just playing things that uh, we copied from records and radio, but things that we, we made ourselves. And so doing that, I listened. I, I, I got several Motown records and Stax records and just sat in my house and would play them and play along with them and just see. I, that's how I learned where choruses and verses were. And, you know, I learned the form of, a, of records, how there was an intro and then a couple verses and then a chorus that kind of thing. I learned that by sitting and listening to other people's records. That's amazing. I really, in- <laughs> I mean, I know. There, was, yeah, there go ahead. was not a lot of live music around here. It was, uh, at, at that time, the, the area I live in, in Alabama, was dry, uh, meaning there were no legal alcohol sales. And so there were no clubs. And so the music I heard were either other bands that I, that I would play with around or go hear around or what was on the radio, and it's a small town here, and there was really one station that every, when I say everyone, uh, that's the, the point of view from of a teenage or early 20s guy. To me, all my friends listened to this one station, and that station played rock and roll and rhythm and blues and maybe a little country, and, I mean, but a, 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 a large selection of the music that was popular at that time. And we didn't always... Different, different rate, sorry, uh, between uh, one or, or the other. You know, like we a lot of records, we didn't know whether they were white artists or black artists. We just knew we liked the music. Yeah, you know, you're painting the the perfect picture. Did you did you actually um, uh, did you ever uh, go uh, buy records from Randy's Record House record shop? Um, 
I, I never ordered any. It was a, a mail order yeah, right. place. Yeah. And I, but I would hear them on a w, WLAC out of Nashville, hear their ads. So I would, we'd be driving back from our gigs. We would hear that was a clear channel station, and so we could hear that nearly everywhere we went late at night. And uh, we we were big fans of John R. Uh, and uh-huh. some of the other uh, disc jockeys that were on at that time. And later I worked with John R., and I was surprised to see that he was an old white Jewish guy. <laughs> you know, because he sounded, he had the, you know, sounded like a hip black uh, DJ. And it was a big surprise to see that he looked like, a, well, I hate to describe how somebody looked, but he didn't look like what, I, what he sounded like on the radio. I love it. I love, you know, it's the same, uh, it, it's like the same thing when people first heard Elvis and they thought he was black. You know, I mean, it's amazing that. Um, I just think that, that, you know, like you said, you learned so much from just what you had around you, a a radio, an instrument, a record, um, your town was, what's interesting to me though, is that you didn't, um, because it was a dry town, there weren't a lot of traveling acts that were coming through Muscle Shoals and yet you decided to go out and actually just develop your own sound on your own. I'm always interested in, like, every... Yeah, I don't think we really tried to develop our own sound. It was, uh, at first, we were just copying everybody else when we would play for these parties and dances and things. But when I started recording, then I realized that I had to make something new and not just do a knockoff of something I heard on the on the radio. And uh, it, it just, it worked out that way. Um, I, more or less, I was... I started playing the bass when I was 18, and by the time I was 23, I had played on this first gold record that I had played on, and that's a very short amount of time to be learning, you know, to learn your instrument and go to a professional level like that. And so I had to learn very quickly. And uh, I, I, so I can say really that I learned how to play my instrument in the recording studio rather than performing on stage. And, and how, how how do you think it, that's so fascinating because you know I, I I've the other rhythm section that comes to mind for me it's I mean obviously not the same sound but it's Chuck Rainey and Bernard Purdy both guys oh, that, yeah. I've interviewed yeah. both those cats and um, you know uh, uh, Chuck um, he he was out on the road with King Curtis before he became a massive studio guy and actually took over for Everett Barksdale and a lot of the the earlier generation guy. So he, he kind of did it the, the reverse way. But wh- I guess my question is, were there in the original studio, uh, must, were, were there veteran cats that you were taking over for at some point? Was there a transition or were you really the first ones? Cause with Chuck and Bern- Bernard and Richard T and those guys, there was a, in New York, there was a, an earlier generation. Well, there was uh, in Muscle Shows uh, at at Fang Studios, the guys that were preceded us were only a year or so older than us. Uh, but they they started they cut the first hits out of Muscle Shows. Uh, uh, I guess the first big hit was Arthur Alexander, "You Better Move On," and uh, this was uh, Jerry Kerrigan on drums, Norbert Putnam on bass, uh, David Briggs on keys, and some other musicians. But when they started having some success, as all people do, I guess anywhere, <laughs> they wanted they moved to Nashville mm. because they knew they could make more money and, 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 and go further working in Nashville. So we were really the first musicians to uh, work in Muscle Shows who stayed in Muscle Shows. We it wasn't our goal to to start here and then move to New York or L.A. or Nashville or anywhere. We decided we wanted to do it here, and and that's when uh, we worked with Rick Hall, uh, as really one of the first producers I worked with, and he had had a lot of doors closed to him in Nashville. He was a songwriter and wannabe producer and a, and a, a musician, and it was, it was a pretty tight click to get in in Nashville. And so he said, "Well, to heck with him. I'm going to try to do it in Muscle Shoals." And uh, he he was trying everything. He tried country records, pop records. It just so happened that the Arthur Alexander record was his first hit, and and was kind of a pop R and B sound. And so he just uh, that brought him other work 
in the R and B field, and uh, it just went from there. And it was sort of true in my career as well. The first records I played on were usually black records. Uh, Etta James, uh, Percy Sledge, later Wilson Pickett, and some of the others. The, that's what I was going to say, is that uh, when you were in the Mystics, you were playing trombone, <laughs> is that right? Well, no, I played the bass guitar in the Mystics. I, I played trombone in, in the school band uh, at school, and then later in college I played trombone. But uh, you, trombone players can't get a lot of work. You know, there's several <laughs> musician jokes about uh, how do you know a, a trombone player has got a job, or, or I forgot now what the deal is, but it's always making fun of Trombone players ain't get a lot of work. As it turns out, I played on two big hit records playing the trombone, but you could get more work playing the bass guitar, and that was that was what I really wanted to do. I haven't played a trombone in years, but that, that is how I started. And you played? Did you play on Tell Mama trombone? You played that? Uh, no, I played bass on that, but I played trombone on uh, James and Bobby Purify, I'm Your Puppet, which uh, just we threw together a horn section and it just happened you know back then it's pretty odd to have a trombone even on a uh, on a horn section recording but uh i would i had one and i would uh i could play so uh we did that that record was a um, i guess it would eventually became a gold record and i also played on uh aretha franklin's i never loved man the way i love you mm. i was in the horn section on that you were in the horn set, and do you remember was Chuck and Bernard playing on rhythm that? No, uh, that was recorded in, in in Muscle Shoals, but it was part Muscle Shoals mus- musicians and part part uh, Memphis musicians. Uh, the bass player was uh, a guy named Tommy Cogbill, who was a great bass player. Uh, one of the guitar players was Chips Moman, who later produced Elvis and just a multitude of other artists. But he was a great guitar player. Uh, uh, other musicians were Roger Hawkins, my partner, uh, drummer, and Jimmy Johnson was a rhythm and guitar player. And Spooner Oldham was keyboard player and later replaced by Barry Beckett when Spooner decided to move to Memphis. Un- so it was a yeah. homegrown band, really, <laughs> uh, from you know Muscle Shoals in Memphis. And the horn section on Aretha's record, record uh they tried to get one horn section. I think they tried to get the Memphis horns, maybe Wayne and uh, Andrew Love or, or somebody like that. But they weren't available, so they just put together the horn section with uh, some really good players and and me. <laughs> well, I mean, it's it's and and we're talking to a. I mean, David Hood for the record. I I was looking through this discography. I mean, and I'm a pretty rabid record guy. I mean, I I seek out the 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 most eccentric stuff, and there's a lot of stuff from early in your career, some of the stuff I've never seen, heard of in my life. I mean, it's really quite remarkable. And I really, I'm trying to, I want, I want you to go back to that time because I found Tell Mama at a thrift store here a few months ago. You know, it's in the, you know, found it at original pressing. I think it came out on chess or cadet. Yeah. And, you know, part of, you know, I picked it up because it's a classic album, but a lot of times I pass on those albums because there's no credit to the accompanists. And I just think to myself, did David at that time, were you just, uh, you know, just, uh, just a, a, like a pig in mud having, having fun, just being able to, to make some, make some dough or did it even well, dawn on you that, that you weren't, I mean, cause there's stuff, you know, we're talking about stuff that you, you never even, your name was never on that stuff. Yeah. Um, I was, I guess a pig in mud. <laughs> I, 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 I started, uh, when I started playing the bass guitar late, but I started in life young. I was married by the time I was 18 and was a father at 20. And uh, I, I was working at a, my father's tire store and playing on weekends, uh, these fraternity parties and things. And when I started getting work at recording sessions, I would do anything to get to play on, on anybody's record, play trombone, shake a tambourine, play the bass, whatever it took. And uh, so I was just thrilled to get to play on these records. Uh, it was, and, and, and eventually I uh, was doing enough work doing that that I could afford to quit my job at the tire store. And that was a huge moment in my life. My father hated it, but I, I loved it. Right, I'm sure it was huge. I mean, it was a really, it was a move towards manhood, you know? 
on top of the fact that you were already a father already. Yeah, yeah, I was, I was, if you'd seen me at that time, you thought, this is a kid. I mean, so <laughs> I looked very young for my age anyway, and I just, the uh, way things happen in my life, I, I got married too soon and was a father, I guess too soon, but much sooner than most people are. Uh, now my son is almost like my brother. I work with a lot of people who are, that our age differences are greater than me and my son when we work together. Mm. At what point did you, so you quit your job, but was there ever a point really, do you remember the first record that you saw your name on? It probably was the Percy Sledge record. Mm -hmm. I, I, I don't remember for sure. I know that uh, I did a early uh, Clarence Carter record at Fame Studios, and they put everybody's name on there, but they put no bass player's name on there. And it just killed me because oh. they didn't recognize me. I, I think I was in it as much for seeing my name printed and hearing myself on the radio as I was for the for the money that I made. And you know, it was a lot of, not a lot of money back in those days, but it was better than working at the tire store. Yeah, absolutely. I, you know, uh, <laughs> I mean, there's, there's no, can you talk a, a little bit about the, it was a dry town. I have, I have, my aunt lives in Decatur. Uh, I don't, I, I know the, the South in this country, southeastern part of the country, is vital to to the United States. The, the, the gumption and the visceral energy and the love and the passion. Um, is Muscle Shoals different from that? Has it, has, what, you got, the South brings so much fire to the table. Uh, lately, though, I've just been sort of like trying to figure out what's going on in the South as far as, um, you know, where, where that... Yeah, go ahead. I think there's a deep love for music. Um, you know, uh, I don't know. I, I guess there is all over the world, but I know that in in the Muscle Shoals area, there were a lot of musicians that played and played in bands, but they would travel to go play other places. And by the way, uh, to Muscle Shoals people, Decatur is a bigger city. I don't know if you've ever been to, to, to Decatur, but it's a, it's it's not a large city, but to us, it was right. <laughs> So, because I mean, I've been there, but I had never been to Mus so Muscle Shoals is, is considerably smaller than Decatur. Well, there's there's four towns here. There's the city of Muscle Shoals, Sheffield, where our studios were, um, uh, Florence, and uh, Tuscumbia, and they're all small towns in a cluster. And uh, so that maybe the whole metropolitan area might be around a hundred thousand. All four towns and the, and the counties surrounding counties. So it's, it's a small area, and it's not a very progressive place to us anyway. We always thought that we were the last ones to hear anything, the Beatles records or anything. <laughs> That's what, it's not progressive. Can you, um, from a music point of view, uh, explain, like you said, you, you could hear everyone from Cannonball Adderley to Ray Charles to the Kingston Trio in a half hour on one station. What is it like now? How, what is it like now? Well, there's more stations uh, now, and it's, you know, back then it was AM. Uh, and, uh, of course, now we have television, uh, satellite radio. You know, we have so many more ways to, to hear music now than we did when I was a kid. If you think about it, in the mid, mid and late 60s, there were no cassette recorders. So if you wanted to record something, you had to use a reel-to-reel -reel recorder, and there were very few that were... Uh, Portable. So when we would learn learn music, we would have to listen to it on the radio and just try to catch whatever we could. And, <laughs> you know, we didn't have a way to record it and copy it and, right. and play it again and again. So we would either learn it from each other or just on the fly on the radio. <laughs> yeah, no, it's 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 like uh, I'm 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 playing that Jimmy Cliff tune on my piano, sitting in limbo, and I can just play it over and over again on my iPhone on YouTube. And you you know, for if, if there was one track coming in. It wasn't like you could stop and rewind. You just had to pick up what you could. Right, right. The, the I, some of those records are pretty difficult to learn like that. You know, we probably learned a lot of them the wrong way. <laughs> <laughs> no, but there is no wrong way. It was just your way, you know. I mean, that's, yeah. you know, I, I just, and I love this region. I mean, I, like I said, I've, 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 I've conquered all the cats, the soul cats, the Motown cats from Detroit and that moved to Los Angeles. I, I'm just so happy to be able to connect with you guys because, um, you brought, there is a piece of Americana 
and that regional music was so, you guys were on so many diverse albums. You know, you look at it and it's just, you say to yourself, you know, there's just, you guys had a, there was a loyal, there was a loyalty to the, and the understanding that the music was above any one individual. And that speaks to yeah. that. Yeah, that's, that's true. I think that's, uh, that was true in our rhythm session. There were no, there was no one guy who was just head and shoulders better, better than everybody else. And there was no one guy that was really a virtuoso on his instrument or anything. We just worked really hard to try to make it sound. And, you know, we, we were, we were dealing in recorded music, so all we had to do is make it sound good one time and record it. <laughs> when was the first time that you uh, ran into the old dirt farmer, Levon Helm? Ah, uh, gosh. Um, I think I ran into him in a bar in Memphis. I, I was had already been playing. And, uh, he had, uh, of course, I was already a fan of the band by that time. But I ran into him, some, I think, in a bar in Memphis. Just I was out late one night. And uh, he came up and spoke to me, and I thought, wow, Levon Helm. <laughs> and I think then he knew that he was leaving the band, or he might have already left the band and was going to be recording. And so, it, as it turned out, we did a couple albums with him. And, of course, I was a, I was really thrilled to get to work with him, and he's such a character. He just, it was, it was uh, a great uh, experience in my life to get to meet him and know him and become friends with him. Can you talk a little bit more about, because I, I, he did some great, you guys did some great albums in the late 70s, I believe the late 70s, um, where he did it at your studios. What was his uh, style? I mean, I, 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 my guess is that he went in there and said, hey guys, I'm not going to tell you how to do it. Let's just have fun. But what was his leadership style or his art, his, uh, his style like that was so, uh, obviously he was a really humorous cat, but you know, what was it about him that, uh, that made the music so vibrant? Well, in, in those situations, when we recorded with him, he didn't even play drums, which is, you think, what? He didn't play drums? Mm -hmm. But Roger Hawkins was a great drummer, and Levon looked up to Roger as a drummer. And uh, Levon was wanting to become a singer and a, a front man more than, he didn't want to have to be playing the drums. He wanted somebody else to play the drums. And we had a, a couple of my partners, uh, produced him on one album and I think I forgot now uh, who produced the other album but it was the producer was the one who picked the songs along with Levon they picked the songs and we just played what we thought was nobody was saying all right you play this and do that uh, we just played what we thought was right for the song which is what we've always done unbelievable and 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 wow this is amazing the the can you talk to the audience a little bit about, I know it was spelled out in the documentary, but um, the original Fame Studios, and then you eventually opened up the, your own studios. Was there, uh, was it just the idea that you guys wanted to, you know, break off, or was it was there a tipping point where there, did it end badly? Can you talk to the audience well, about it? it? it didn't end, well, it, it ended badly, but not, we, nobody was mad at each other, but when we left, we didn't leave because we were, mad at Rick Hall or any, any, or he was mad at us there were there was just a, an opportunity came up Rick was uh, signing an album deal with Capitol Records and he wanted to put the rhythm section uh, on contract where we worked only for him and nobody else and I was going to guarantee us so much a year to do that uh, well at that time we were already playing on records by a lot of different people and making more money than we would be making by, you know, with that guarantee. And also at the same time, a, a studio uh, came available in Muscle Shoals that a fellow had built but didn't know really what to do with it. He made an offer to uh, Jimmy Johnson and Roger Hawkins. Uh, he wanted to sell the studio to them, and they realized early on that they would need a band to work with them. So... Uh, when Rick told us that he wanted this exclusive, we said, well, we don't really want to be exclusive, and we found a, a studio that we can get at a decent price. The guy's going to help finance it for us. And, and so we left, and we, were, we weren't really expecting him to be upset by that. And we thought, well, he's, you know, he's a great producer. He can produce records with anyone, and he, he proved that he could afterward, but 
when we told him we were leaving, he said, all right, well, this is it. You'll never work here again, mm. you know, that kind of thing. Mm-hmm. So it, it, it became where it wasn't such a good thing. But we were, we didn't, you know, nobody was mad before we left. We just saw an opportunity. You know, it's really interesting uh, where, I, and I can respect both sides, uh, you know, in, in, in how. Yeah, I can too now, but at the time I was young and I, I thought, well, he'll, he'll, he'll be fine without us. <laughs> You know, as best you can, um, how, I guess, how did you develop a reputation um, amongst, was it like a certain label? I mean, when I look at Millie, uh, Millie Jackson, Staple Singers, you guys were doing black artists, you were doing white artists, you were doing Southern rock, you were doing soul records. So at that point, when you moved into the studio, you already had that reputation as somebody funneling people down. Like if Herbie Mann wanted to come, they say, oh, you got to go to you got to go to these guys. Did it take a while to get them to steer into the new building or did it, was well, it? It was, uh, we, we worked working with Rick Hall. He had, uh, work, did work for Atlantic records through Jerry Wexler. And he worked with, uh, chess records with, uh, Leonard chess. And he worked with different labels and plus other people would come do sessions at his studios and hire us that he didn't work with. That, that just came to us because they'd heard things that we had recorded, with other people and that's the way it's always been when we left uh, him and started our own studio atlantic records told us that they would give us business uh uh if we started our studio and we they helped helped us get a loan to update our equipment Mm -hmm. and uh they didn't really finance us we borrowed money and uh we the way we paid back that money is we gave them a really uh inexpensive studio time and gave them a break on the musician's pay and gave them half of the publishing company that we were starting. Wow. And so they, they got, it was a pretty good deal for them. They had a band that they could depend on to shoot artists into anytime they wanted and uh, at a cut rate price. So it, it was a good deal for Atlantic Records. But uh, after a while, Atlantic wanted to move a lot of their recording to Miami. And they wanted us to go there, and we said, well, we don't want to go to Miami. So uh, they picked up and got another rhythm section to work with them in Miami and uh, just left us. And when they did that, it just so happened that the MGs were no longer wanting to be the full-time rhythm section at Stax. And so we started getting a lot of work with Stax. It was a lot of accidental things that happened, and it was, it was good fortune for us. That is, yeah, you have to have a lot of good fortune. It's that, the, that producer, uh, Hall, uh, you, you yes. know, he had, he had doors shut on him, like you said, uh, up in, in uh, Nashville. And then when he came down, the door opened in Muscle Shoals. But it's, you guys sort of, um, but it really is about developing. I, I, when you first moved into that studio, who were some of the first guys, I mean, that came in there uh, and, uh, you know, because, I mean, well, you, Go ahead. Yeah, uh, Atlantic Records, like I said, they lent us the money, some of the money, to update our studio where we could, I mean, we, that studio was a four-track studio when we bought it, and we had to go eight-track, which meant we had to update the, the console, and you know, it was a lot of expense to get uh, where we could be in modern times, more or less. <laughs> and so the first artist they sent was Cher. And they recorded a, a, a Cher's first solo album there, wow. which was not a hit. It was just it was a pretty good album, but it was not a hit. Uh, one of the next artists artist was uh, Bob Skaggs on his first solo album. I love that. It album. wasn't a hit either, and it, it's the one that has "Loan Me a Dime" uh, and all that on it. Great album. Oh but man, it was not a hit, and it was really and truly the first hit we had for Atlantic Records was R. B. Greaves' "Take a Letter, Maria." And that was about a year and a half to almost two years after we had started our business. And we were really sweating it by that time because we thought, well, any day now they're going to pull the note and say, well, all right, it's over. It's not working out. But luckily we got the first hit. And then after that, started getting a few other hits. And then like in the movie, uh, the Rolling Stones came and, and that didn't really hurt, but that didn't. We didn't get to, at that time, we couldn't tell people the Rolling Stones were recording at our studio because they didn't have the proper work permits to record it in the United States. So it was a, <laughs> the movie kind of makes it all seem happened overnight sort of deal, but it was a period of time before we 
after we left and started our own studio and when we had the first hit record. You know, you keep using this word hit record and you, you've been on hundreds, if not thousands of, 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 of albums. Um, that wasn't, I mean, what, you, you can't, if you go into the studio trying to make a hit, you're not going to make a hit. I just want to get your opinion on this idea of a hit because it seems like it put a, a tremendous amount of stress on the on the artists and you had these producers, like you were saying, I mean, you listen back to these and they're getting rediscovered. That original Boz Skaggs album, Loan Me a Dime, that is one of my favorite songs. I, I, yeah. to, to me, it's like, okay, so when did that when did that become the 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 emphasis, the idea of saying you got to make. Well, it was always the emphasis. If you, you know, the people will come and record someplace where somebody else has recorded a hit record because that's what everybody wants is a hit record. I mean, especially in the old days when it was a radio hit, and uh, that's what everybody was looking for. And that's how we got our work. Once we started cutting records that people liked, other artists wanted to get their, you know, cut records that people would like, and so it would attract. Artists and producers, everybody wants a hit record. I and mean, we needed it to keep our doors open and pay our rent and pay our mortgages and the whole thing. But it wasn't. We weren't, we, we weren't getting big money for, you know, when I say a hit record, we didn't make the money from the hit record. We made union scales or, or even less than union scales on these recordings we made. Uh, some of the biggest hits I played on, I made about $72 on or something like that. <laughs> And you hear you hear them every day. Yeah, I know. And I mean, but that is so magical. It's 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 absolutely unquantifiable. Your contributions to to society. I mean, it's seventy. I think that's why they made a movie. <laughs> that's right. Yeah, it, the story was so different and 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 unique. I think that's the reason they made the movie. Is uh, there's not many stories quite like that, where the band owns the studio. Well, and you can bet in today's world. That wouldn't exist. I mean, oh, no. you would have, it'd be so cutthroat, you'd have to go in there and you would be raking in serious dough because it's all about yeah. that now. <laughs> yeah, we, when we, we started, when we made our partnership together and started our own studio, we knew it was going to be really tough. And so we made an agreement right off the bat that it was all for one and one for all, that nobody would, nobody would, you know, it would, if we, any of us work, we would all work. And uh, we, we, kept to that pretty much always where it would be the whole rhythm section recording on a project even if they only wanted one guy to begin with they had to get the whole band and it was not that you know it wasn't like spending millions of dollars we were working for scale or less usually less because we would work longer than the allotted time for recordings did you ever um i'm just curious about your did you ever get off on the the kind of stuff in the early seventies, the the Mahavishnu stuff that uh, Rick Laird and Billy Cobham were doing? Did you did you listen yeah. to that? Yeah. Tell me a little bit about your experiences in the in in, in playing quote unquote like fusion or I hate that term, but just jazz. Uh, yeah, well, we didn't do that. We uh, we played uh, what we played was uh, I think R and B flavored pop music, and later on when we started doing a little country music it was kind of r&b flavored country music uh, and i don't know what to say about the r&b part of it it's just that, that was the music that we all loved growing up and it's it's like i can't change my accent i still <laughs> I still have a southern accent no matter how long i speak <laughs> i love it no i love it the um uh, w without hall uh being the conduit who was your sort of who was the cat that took over the the um, negotiation, not negotiation, but just the dialogue with Atlantic Records when you moved into your studio? Was it, was it... Uh... Well, we all did. I guess Jimmy Johnson was the one. Jimmy worked as a... Uh, Jimmy was Rick Hall's first employee, and he, he had just come out of the Army, so he knew how to type fast. He was a clerk or something in the Army. And he could type fast, and he was an assistant engineer, so he knew the, the, you know, the console and how to mix a session. He he knew a lot of the he, he got roots training and at the, from the very start, working with Rick and, and running his publishing company and doing things like that. So he had the most experience of the four of us as far as running a studio. And people, when they would call and book the studio, they would usually talk to Jimmy at first 
later on it would be me or or any of us. But at, at first, a lot of the business talk went between Jimmy and some of the different people. But the record companies would call and book studio time, and they would send a producer and the artist. And uh, some, you know, after a while, that was handled by um, our secretary or something like that yeah. because. We were working musicians, so we couldn't just sit there in the office all day and talk on the phone. Right. I'm just trying to figure out, like you said, in that year and a half when you made those records and they weren't hits, you know, you were sweating it out. But was it was anybody trying to assuage Atlantic or was, did you really maybe it was just no, in your no, own? We, we were OK. We uh, we had a we had a, an agreement with Atlantic that they would send us artists to work with. Mm -hmm. I think we were all surprised that the first artists they sent uh, were Cher and uh, then Boss Gags, and then there was a lot of white artists, and our most of our experience had been cutting black music. And that, I think, surprised us at first, because we thought, well, this is kind of a disadvantage here, recording music that we don't really know anything about. But uh, we, had a, you know, we had a relationship. We were, by that time, we were friends with Jerry Wexler and Tom Dowd and Arif Mardin and, and, and then later Ahmed Erdogan. And they would call, and we'd talk to them just like I'm talking to you. They're, they're businessmen, but they're also music people. And uh, they would say, well, look, we want this kind of sound on a certain thing with a certain artist. And we would, we would do our homework and try to get what they looked for. Uh, when, we, uh, when Paul Simon first decided he was going to come and record with us, well, I remember riding around in the car with uh, Barry and Jimmy and Roger, and we listened to a lot of Paul Simon's music, si Simon and Garfunkel, and also his some of his first solo record, mm -hmm. just to see what was going to be expected of us to record with him. And so we we would know who who was coming, and we we would try to be prepared. It's it's uh the did you do any. At, in your career early on, was there any live touring at all? Not really. The first time we went on any kind of really big tour was in 1972. We had been recording with uh, Jimmy Cliff and Island Records, and uh, the guys in traffic heard what we were recording with uh, Jimmy Cliff, and it was at that time they were needing a bass player and a drummer to tour with them uh they had just cut low spark of high hill boys and they needed a, a rhythm section and uh chris blackwell uh suggested us and they listened to what we had been doing with jimmy cliff and said okay let's get these guys <laughs> wait, wait hold and on we hold, didn't hold know, on we hold. didn't know who, we hey, didn't know on. who traffic was <laughs> hold on for a second i'm i'm i i what albums did you play with you were playing on jimmy cliff albums in the early 70s yes uh, we we cut Sitting in Limbo, which is probably the bigger hit of the things that we've recorded with him because that was in the, the movie the, the Harder They Come or Harder They Fall, whatever it is. Uh, we we played that, and we had done two albums, I think, with him of material that uh, he had written, but they didn't really want it. At that time, reggae music was not popular. They didn't really... They didn't really want it to sound like reggae music, so they would send him to us, and we would, I guess you could say, Americanize it or <laughs> try to make it have more of an R and B flavor than than th what he was writing. The way he was writing was was a more of a Jamaican feel, but that was not popular at that time. Exactly, I was going to say reggae did not really get a foothold until maybe a little later on in that in the decade. Yeah, it's the so first the first tour that I played uh, with Traffic was 1972, and uh, the music they would play on the sound system before we would play was Bob Marley's uh, Catch a Fire album. And I had never heard music like that before, and I was just, I was just knocked out. I thought, wow, I just <laughs> love that way that beat is on that. And that was our first experience with really what you call reggae music. Yeah, no, let's talk about that because the when I interviewed John Densmore from The Doors, they, they, were, they got hip to reggae music, and it was... The bass, the drummer was playing on the one, the one and the three instead of the two and the four. What was the difference yeah. with reggae music? What was the, what was so cool about the, the bass and the drums that they were doing that really kind of blew your mind? Well, it just, it, it just had a great sound and it was different from what we had been hearing. I, I don't really know how to describe it other than it was definitely different. 
and uh, and it, it's proven to be a lasting difference now. What what are you uh, what was the experience like uh, playing? I I can never pronounce his name, but the uh, the percussionist with traffic at that time. Yeah, Rebop Kwakuba. That's him. His name was Anthony Rebop Kwakuba, and he was the son of a uh, uh, African chieftain. Grew up in Ghana, a very pr- primitive uh, village. He when he was a uh, a child fell off uh, a ox cart that his grandmother or his, one of his parents or somebody was was driving and he broke his arm and uh, they took him to a doctor a white doctor and the doctor set his arm when he got back to the village the his grandmother took all the the cast off and and put herbs and wrapped it in mud and stuff and so his his arm grew back a little bit crooked but they didn't believe in uh the white man's medicine mm-hmm, <laughs> mm-hmm. But he was quite a character. He was uh, that was a great experience in my life working with traffic, just because I got to see a lot of different things uh, that I had never seen before. Like what? Uh, work, well, like working with a with a drummer from Ghana. Uh, we just I didn't even know where Ghana was. <laughs> but uh, it, that was. Uh, but working with an English group uh, that played that kind of music, we were used to playing records that were three minutes long. You know, had the record, re- regular record pop music form, and when you play with a group like Traffic, they would play songs that were 15 and 16, 20 minutes long, and uh, with only two or three chords in the whole song. So it was a different thing to have to figure out what to play uh, like that. It was just a whole different format. I agree. We got, we got where we adapted to doing it, but at first it was really hard for us. How did you get comfortable? Was it just after a tour, by the end of it, you'd get it down? Because I know what you're saying. I mean, this is more about improvising over one or two chords. And that's yeah, very different yeah, than... It took, it took uh, a few nights playing with them. And the, the first night that we played with them, it was in uh, New Haven, Connecticut. And uh, at a big, uh, I guess it was, uh, whatever, Yale. Maybe it was Yale University. It was a big... A big university and a and a big concert hall, and we, prior to that first performance, we had run through the songs maybe two times, and so Roger and I had made ourselves little chord charts so we would know what the songs were. You know, I didn't forty thousand head men. I didn't know what the heck is that, <laughs> <laughs> and uh, and so we we got out there and soon realized you couldn't even see our chord charts because of the light and stuff. Oh, so we just had to learn. I mean, it was tough first first few nights it was really hard and I, I don't know how the guys in traffic stuck with us but I guess they just needed to make it work and we needed to make it work so it, after a few nights it did start working did you so during those first couple nights you know inevitably with younger generations <laughs> afterwards if it was a struggle there'd be a lot of dialogue and maybe some you know communicate did you guys were you talking to the guys from traffic about it or was it just like oh yeah yeah i mean they they seemed happy i mean from the first they seemed they were guys that did it it was kind of like anything goes i think roger even mentioned that in the in the film he said he wasn't he was not used to working that way before because we would try so hard to make something as good as we could get it and with traffic it was just like any okay that's okay no matter what we did it would seem like that they were happy with it they thought well that's that's cool a different way to do it but uh we eventually got it the way it should be i think and it didn't really take that long i'm, I'm saying two or three nights that it, it it couldn't have taken much more than that, or we probably would have gotten fired. <laughs> right, right. But it's it was like, I mean, that was a seismic, seismic change to go from, you know, the the comfy studios with set number, yeah, all really of a was. sudden over to, and then you're talking about a period of time when everybody was stretching out. I mean, you'd have 12 minute tracks on CTI records of jazz, and you know, traffic was it was a total exploratory stuff, and you're going the opposite way. Are there? Are there uh, like bootleg recordings of that of that tour at all? Is there any live stuff? Yeah, uh, I've I've got a cassette of uh, some early somewhere. I, I don't know <laughs> where, but I'm sure I do of some stuff. But I mean, it sounded okay. It was not. It, it sounded like what what they what it was supposed to sound like. We just weren't comfortable at first mm. ourselves, but we got comfortable. You had we had to. 
how did uh, how, this is what I'm what I'm saying? Like, how did you even meet Chris Blackwell to begin with? Well, he brought. I think we met him with uh, Jimmy Cliff. I, I believe he was the one that first brought Jimmy Cliff to us. But at that time, we were working with a lot of different producers. Some some from England. We worked with Denny Cordell, who worked with uh, Leon Russell. And uh, Denny was a friend of Chris Blackwell. It was a, you know, it's kind of like a network of guys that we would work with, and they'd say, "Well, we like this," and I will suggest our friend come work with you, that kind of thing. And uh, Chris, Bla- I think everybody liked that we were able to learn things quickly uh, in a recording session. You know, time is money. You know, it's, that's right. You're paying. You're paying a. a studio rate you're hiring musicians you've got engineers you got all these people it's expensive and so the quicker that we could learn something and get it good enough to record the better it would be and we were very quick doing that we we made uh i mean we could go from a song that we had never heard to have to having a complete track in an hour usually uh and that was because we would make chord charts that were easily adaptable if they say well we like doing this in the key of D but we believe E would be better we could change the key without having to change our charts because we used a, a number system for our charts and that made it very easy and we were good at it we just we got really good at it and then like with Jimmy like what was that he what was his style like as in the, I mean, I still haven't gotten to him yet, you know, but, but yeah, I mean, well, he, you're talking about Jimmy Cliff. Sure. Yeah. Yeah. Well, he would come to us with his guitar and, or a tape of his songs, or he would sit there on the, and play the song, sing and play the guitar, and play his songs. And we would make us ourselves a chord chart of the arrangement, you know, of the verse and the chorus. We would make that. And then we would, if they wanted to change something, they would change it. And we would, it was just a, what you call head arrangements, we would work it out on the spot and then we'd record it. And we got very good at being able to learn somebody's song quickly and get uh, and good enough to where they could record it quickly. Yeah, no, because this is blowing my mind. I mean, you you were definitely the first uh, American rhythm section to be playing on reggae records. Is that right? Well, I don't know if the records we cut were reggae. That's, that's what I'm saying. That's is right. we, He would come with these songs that mm-hmm. sounded like they wanted to be reggae, but nobody knew what reggae was then. But our instructions for, from Chris Blackwell and, and whoever was in charge was we need to make these more like what is played on American radio. And so we would de-Jamaicanize them a little bit, I guess, or, or, or try to play them more like a, a rhythm and blues song. You know, it's funny, and, when uh, I listen... So they weren't really that successful, uh, other than sitting in limbo. They're, the others, they're really good, but, you, you know, they weren't hits or anything. Right, and, and yeah, but let's put, set aside the hit thing. I mean, it was good music, and... Uh, yeah, oh yeah, and, and, you, I, and some of those records... I wish I had a copy of some of those records that we did with Jimmy, because his, it, was, it was really good stuff. Well, I'm going to have to send you some records if you don't have. I mean, this is to yeah. me, this is like uh, this is a confounding. Uh, you know, like th- there was one on. Uh, it's called the Sun, the Moon, and the Stars. I'm not trying uh-huh. to. Uh, you know, I'm just I'm, when I listen back to some of his early stuff, it definitely whatever the directions or the instructions were from Black from uh, Blackwell, uh, uh, they they were followed followed through on because it did you're right it was not that choppy island feel there was definitely yeah. a sm- or more of a muscle shoals smoky r&b flavor to it it was just a little bit different so you guys did it the right way the um <laughs> the uh the idea of uh arif mardin um he you and him got you started to produce a lot too uh in the what year did you start producing well, I'm I never have really considered myself a producer. I I work with a lot of different artists. Uh I never really liked producing, but we would co-produce as a rhythm section with a lot lot of people. Just I I guess they would need they felt they needed our input and felt like they needed to give us something for it. So after a while we would start getting a production point uh working with them, but I, I think they just they thought they needed to compensate us somehow, even if it was just uh, credit on a record, for our extra input because they weren't getting that kind of input from 
a lot of the other people they were recording with. You know, I guess they would go to a studio and hire a bunch of musicians. And the guys would just sit there and say, "All right, well, what do you want me to do?" That kind of thing. Where we would try to make it out of make it into something, whatever. When did you, when did you see the shift start to occur? When like you said, you'd be on the phone with Arif or. Blackwell or, or these guys that were businessmen, but they knew music. When was that shift in our society when all of a sudden it went from businessmen that understood music and sort of let the musicians and got out of the way, as opposed to guys that were micromanagers and had no idea what they were doing and were, and just totally, when did that begin? When did you start to see that? Well, uh, the shift away from that, I guess, is they, the good ones started dying out. You know, we lost Tom Dow, uh, Jerry Wexler, mm-hmm. or Wover, all the Atlantic guys are all gone now. But they were really music. They didn't. They weren't musicians themselves necessarily, but they were music lovers. Mm-hmm. They knew what they wanted uh, like that. And we were able. They could sit there and say, "Well, make it kind of go like this." And we so we would try. You know, we we were easy to deal with because we weren't schooled ourselves. Sometimes somebody would bring a record in of something and said, we want it to sound kind of like this. And so we would take this, the new song and uh, adapt it to where it sounded like something they wanted it to sound like. And I guess that's easier than having to go right out an arrangement with school musicians and, and do that. You know, we would, it was trial and error with us. I love it. No, you, you guys were... And, and we didn't mind that. You know, that's the way we were used to working. Yeah, you guys are called street scholars. You were not in <laughs> The thing is that that in, that's one of the issues now in academia, I think, without being a musician myself, is just people get very comfortable in their own little box, and the minute they get outside of it, they get real agitated. And to me, you guys were just sort of like, well, we'll give it a, we'll give it a shot. We got the chops. We, we'll probably figure yeah. it out. And I still do that. I, I, I still am active as a studio player whenever I get the call, and I go, I, I worked uh about two months ago with mike scott and the water boys mm-hmm. and i had heard of the water boys and heard some of their music on satellite radio but i wasn't really a you know i didn't really know exactly what they were doing i walk in cold and uh he plays the song and i start figuring out what to play and he'll make a suggestion and i'll try something <laughs> i'm just i've always worked that way and it 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 seems to be working out the um Russell Smith uh, and the Muscle Shoals All Stars. Were you part of that band? Uh, I have worked with Russell Smith quite a bit. I don't know if I would exactly what that particular thing is. Uh, he he did a solo album at our studio. I don't. I'm not even sure I played on that on that first one. But I I'm, I know Russell very well, and I've worked with him many times. Uh, Can you talk about him as a what he I. I had an interview with him a while back. He total character that guy. I love that uh, guy. He certainly is. He's one of the last true artists. Uh, I, I played with him as uh, either on some of his solo recordings or with the Amazing Rhythm Aces, and uh, I, I got and I did that several times before I ever just saw him go into a, a, a place and sit down with his guitar and sing by himself. And I, that's when I really realized what a great artist he was. Is when he, when I wasn't being a backup musician, but just sitting there in the audience listening to him, I thought, well, God, this guy's incredible. <laughs> but I'd worked with him quite a bit before I was aware of that. I just I was more concentrating on learning the song, getting the chords right, that kind of thing. Were you on but, any uh, of? He, yeah, were you on any of? He's the, quite a character. He, no, I mean he was the first Southern cat that I really, uh, you know, that I was able to get to, and and uh, and. And he, he just, we had the best conversation and he was just so, uh, a genius. He's just a genius. And I, you know, I've never seen him perform it. it to me, it, it raises an interest. What you say there is like the idea, sometimes you're, you're, you're in the studio and you're playing on somebody's album and you, and you're just fixated on making sure that you get it right. And you don't realize the, how great they are until you actually sit in the audience and see them. That's a really fascinating yeah. kind of thing. Were you on? Were you on uh, any of those early Amazing Rhythm Aces albums, like The End Is Not In Sight? Were you playing bass on those? Um, I'm, I'm The End Is Not In Sight. I played on that, but uh, uh, I think that was one of his solo records. But I, I you know, the, the Aces, their first hit 
rec- recording was uh, uh, Third Rate uh, Romance. Third Rate Romance. And that, I didn't play on any of that, but I, I, I was definitely aware of them. They came as a group and, and recorded an album at our studio uh, several years after Third Rate Romance. And I, so I got to know all the guys then. And then later on, the, the, the group started falling apart until pretty soon it was only Russell and uh, Billy Earhart, the keyboard player. And so I work with them quite often now, uh, either in a live situation or recording. You work with them now? Yes. Oh, my God. I would love to interview Billy Earnhardt. I played with them, uh, I'm trying to think, the last time I played at the Bluebird in Nashville with them. <sighs> and it was people were standing out in the street, waiting in line in a pouring rain. Uh, they're, they're, they still have a pretty good following, and I'm, I'm happy to be the the bass player on a lot of his live uh, performances, as well as his recordings. You know, you, this is, I'm just going to read through this for the audience. I mean, from starting in about 1972, uh, we have David Hood on uh, Bobby Womack album, Tony Joe White, who I love to death, Boz Skaggs, the staple singer, it was Barry Goldberg, Dwayne Allman, Paul Simon, Peter Yarrow, uh, traffic. There, there are a couple on the road. I see that album all the time, but I don't see you get. Are you on that album? It says you're playing yes. bass. Yeah, you're I'm playing bass and you're giving credit for it. Though is what I'm saying on the album. Yeah, in fact, I was a member of the group. I guess you could say for, for two years, and our picture is on the the, the albums that we played on, and and uh, our names are on there. It just goes. That was just that was just another job. <laughs> Can I mean, I, I love, you know, I, I enjoy, the people I work with, I really enjoy working with. And it, it, it's, I, I think there must be a God out there because I'm, I've been very fortunate to work with some of the really good people uh, and people that I, that I enjoy working with. You know, as we wrap up part one here with David Hood, um, I wanted to ask you how you feel. Um, do you have opportunities to mentor? And do you do you feel like it's... Do you feel a responsibility at, at being a link in the chain of music? Uh, yes, I do, and I, I do enjoy that, and it is a responsibility. I, people have asked me at times if I would teach lessons, and I, I don't really, I don't read music, so I, I, I think I'd have a hard time teaching. I don't want to teach anybody the wrong way, I think is what I'm saying. But I try to be a good example as far as the discipline of showing up on time with your equipment working and everything being in tune and really listening and trying to figure out the right thing to do with, with, with the artist. Uh, I, I try to, by example, uh, show that to the younger people. Uh, my, like I've said, my, my son is a musician, has a group called the Drive-By Truckers, and uh, I've tried to help them whenever I could. They don't always listen to me, but I, I do try to be a good example. Well, I had no idea your son was in the drive-by truckers. Yeah. Oh man, that's that's no. I was gonna say, so they don't listen. What do you look at when you see? Uh, well, your son is actually like you said. You guys are somewhat. You you had him very young. You you yourself is only about twenty year age difference. Is that right? Yes. So they, but they, so you try to give him some advice, but they won't always listen. What do they? Well, yeah, you know, I mean, early on, it'd be things like. Why don't you tune your guitar? <laughs> or why don't you sing on key? Or why don't you make the lyric where somebody can understand what you're you're saying? You know, simple things like that. And uh, them being young guys and and by God, we're going to do it my way kind of thing. A lot of times they would just ignore me, but I think after many years now, I think they do listen to my my suggestions and sometimes follow them. But I don't want I don't want to. You know, he can't do it like I did it, and I couldn't do it the way he's done it. Uh, it's, everybody has to learn their own way how to do uh, make it in the music business because it's a difficult life. And luckily, mine has always been in the studio, or mostly in the studio, and I'm very comfortable in the studio. Uh, I, I'm not really comfortable on a stage in front of a big crowd, and I don't really like riding in a van 12 hours to go somewhere to play an hour. I, you know, that, that part of what they do, I could never do. But you do do it but for, I, for but Russell I can't Smith. I sit in the recording studio for 12 hours 
and work on a, a song over and over and over. I, you know, I do that, and I'm I'm good at that. Can you just uh, leave us with a, a story about um, your experience playing with how you got to play with uh, Dwayne Allman? Okay, uh, that's a pretty good one. Uh, uh, Dwayne uh, and his one of his early groups, the Hourglass, came and recorded at a Fame Recording Studio, and my partner Jimmy Johnson was picked to be the uh, sound engineer on that because. Well, Rick Hall didn't want to do that. That group, you know, he Rick had other things to do, and so that was well, I don't want to mess with those guys. And so Jimmy ended up working with them, and saw early on that Dwayne was an exceptional guitar player. And about the same time, I was working with Eddie Hinton, uh, a guitar player that we worked with quite a bit. And uh, Eddie Eddie knew Dwayne, and uh, he said, "Well, you got to hear this guy." And so. Coming back from California one time, uh, Dwayne came through town and said, "I'd like to learn, you know, work on some recording sessions." And uh, and so he did. He came and we did some. He worked on the Boscag session, the Clarence Carter session, and a few other things. He never really liked being a studio player. He wanted to be a, you know, like half the Allman Brothers. He wanted to have a, a band of his own and play what he wanted. He didn't really want to play on songs that he didn't like but we had worked several times together and really enjoyed working with him and i think he enjoyed working with us even though he he didn't want to be a studio player he wanted to have his own band and record his own thing but he really but we, did but he did enjoy playing with you guys i mean you, you're on that oh MP. yeah yeah very much i think he did but whereas we would come in at 10 o'clock in the morning and work with the artist and do five or six songs and take a break and come back and do two more songs, something like that. Dwayne didn't want to come in until two in the afternoon, and if he didn't like the song, he didn't want to play on it. And you can't do that if you're going to make a career being a studio musician. <laughs> yeah, right. And, uh, you know, and also we were guys with married and had a wife and a kid and uh, a mortgage. Dwayne didn't want to have any part of that either. And uh, But we got along very well. I think he respected what we did. And we all res- really respected what he did, but knew early on that he, he would have to do it in his situation where he was in control, like with the Allman Brothers. I was going to say, I just came across 1971 here, Jimmy Cliff, Another Cycle. And uh, there's Inside Out and Upside Down, Oh, How I Miss You, They're Sitting in Limbo. Yeah. Uh, yeah. My, I, I've never seen this record before. I have to go find now all these records. Yeah, I'd like to hear some of those. We did one, I think it was called My Best Friend's Girl or something like that. It's something like uh, his song is about his my, my best friend. It's called my friend's, my friend's Wife. Yeah, that's it. And I think that, thought that was great. Uh, <laughs> I mean, he had a lot of good songs. And that is just, it's unfortunate that they didn't become big, bigger records than they did. It's uh, water under the bridge now, but uh, back then, you know, he was trying to get corn and visions. And uh, don't you realize, though, David, that 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 once 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 we leave this planet, or you do, that that uh, that those songs will be are already going to be, you know, come back again. I mean, that's the well, that's great. Yeah, you know, that's the thing that's is, a, yeah, immortality. I guess. <laughs> well, I'm just saying, like at 36, you know, I just said I I I I I don't like anything related to the you know finnegan told me the other night he just said that um 25 years ago he could have he could have predicted where the uh where the industry quote unquote which is really more of a business now uh was going Sorry about that phone. that's all right that's all right the the what what he said was that um now he has no idea and he, he couldn't tell you what direction the indus- the business is going in he has no clue yeah, well, I don't think anybody did. Um, um, we we did a, an album with Mike Finnegan, uh, a solo album. I don't know if you've heard that. I have it. I just uh, picked it up the other. It's amazing. It's got a, it, It's one of my favorite albums. It's Wex, Wexler yeah, put it. I haven't heard it since we recorded it. I'm going to mail it to you. I'm going to mail it to you immediately. I'll get your address. Go ahead. Okay. You know, you tell me the story about 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 the industry though.
I'm, 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 I'm sorry. I, I missed what you said. It's okay. If you need to go, do you need to, do you need to go? No, I don't need to go. My phone keeps ringing, and I don't know what it is. <laughs> nobody, nobody else here but me, so I, nobody's answering it. Well, no, it's okay. It's it's a, it's a talk with the spirits. No, the the um, I was just asking you, like, you know, Finnegan. He has a son too. That's also uh, a musician, and uh, I just don't think he has any. He can't see the. He can't see where it's headed, but I do want to say at 36, I mean, I just say I see all the barriers that have been put up in music, all the walls that have been put up, all the stratification and the labeling in order to, quote unquote, help people figure out what kind of music they like. And I just wanted to go back before my time to find cats that like yourself and tell these stories because... No, I didn't even know going in today that Jimmy Cliff would come up to Muscle Shoals and play an album with you guys. And to know that, it's just, it's just scintillating. So my point is that 20, 30 years down the road, we, you know, we might be gone. But that's when this stuff will re- I mean, that's the, the, the cycling of life, you know. It's a beautiful part yeah, of if life. I'm, if I'm here in 30 years, I'll be 100. <laughs> <laughs> You'll be here. Anyway... David, I'll, 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 I'll call you in a little while to get your address. I'll send you that Finnegan album, and, I, and we'll definitely set up a time to do part two. Okay, well, great. I, I really enjoyed this, and I, I'm, I'm glad that you've enjoyed it. I, I, I think the stories are, are interesting. It's, it's, it's a very unique thing, and I think I'm just, just now becoming aware of how what a strange or interesting thing has happened to me uh, this last 50 years of uh, I just never expected that a guy, a kid growing up in Alabama and working at his father's tire store and then going from that to playing on records and going all over the world. You know, that I'm as amazed as, as anybody is. Well, I think that's why it just, that's why it continues today. And, uh, you know, for anybody that is aware, they realize that the homogenization of our country is an extremely dangerous thing. And, uh, and that to me, uh, the only way you can go and sort of break that down is by going back and talking to the guys who grew up, like you said, like yourself, totally innocent, and only now being aware of the impact that they're going to have on future generations as well. So thank you, brother, and uh, we'll be in touch. Sure. Thank you. All right, David. Goodbye. Bye. This is the Jake Feinberg Show. We'll see you all in a little bit.